Hallelujah. Lord, we declare that our God is greater, our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other, Father. Hallelujah. Our God is greater, Jesus. We worship you, Father. Lord, you are worthy of the of the Lord, Father. Oh.
nothing is greater than our God. Hallelujah. Lord, we declare that you are high and lifted up, Father. How great is our God, Jesus. We declare, Father, how great is our God. Sing me how great is our God. Oh, sing how The splendor of the King, clothed in majesty, clothed in majesty. Let all the earth rejoice, let all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself, he wraps himself in light. Darkness tries to hide.
Father, we declare that you are great and greatly to be praised. There is no one like you, Lord, in all the earth. Lord, you are high and lifted up, Jesus. And we declare that you are great, God. You are a great God. We give you praise, in Jesus' name. Welcome to Raisewood Relaunch 2020 Online. So glad that you've joined with us today. We have a word from the Lord for you that I believe will be an encouraging word along with some correction in our life as well. We're dealing with the title, Dear Church, Seven Letters to the Seven Churches of Revelation, and we're dealing today with the Church of Pergamos, which is known as the Compromising Church. Scripture that we're going to be reading from is Revelations chapter 2, beginning with verse 12. I want to encourage you to turn there in your Bible and follow along with us. It's always good, and you'll see why in a minute. It's always good to have the Word of God right here in your hand, ready to study God's Word. I have some good news for you today. I believe it's news that will encourage your heart and bless you. I pray that when you hear these words, when you hear this phrase, it's going to cause you to rejoice. Not to be fearful, but to rejoice. Here's the words. Jesus is coming soon. I don't know about you, but that resonates within my spirit. It resonates within my heart. I saw a sign the other day that said, ready or not, Jesus is coming. I pray that you're ready. I, I, Brazewood, I want to be ready. How about you? In fact, not only be ready, I want to stay in a perpetual state of readiness. Every day, awakening to the thought Jesus could come today, and I want to be ready. How about you? Let's read a text in our Bible, Revelations chapter 2. We're going to begin with verse number 12, and I want to encourage you to follow along to make sure that I'm speaking the right words, the truth. Revelation chapter 2, verse 12, and I'm reading from the NIV. To the angel of the church of Pergamum, write, These are the words of him who has a sharp, double-edged sword. Now, we're going to come back to that because that is very, very important. Here's the commendation. I know where you live, where Satan has his throne. How would you like to be in that city? goes on. Yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, not even in the days of Antipas. My faithful witness who was put to death in your city where Satan lives. Here's the correction. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. There are some among you who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin so that they ate food sacrificed to idols and committed sexual immorality. Likewise, verse 15, you also have those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Verse 16, repent, therefore, otherwise I will soon come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. And here's the promise. Verse 17, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give that person a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the person who receives it. Before we go on, let's look at the city of Pergamos for just a moment. Uh, the, the city of Pergamos was in a Roman, Roman province of Asia in the west of what is now known as Turkey, about 45 miles north of Smyrna, which itself, Smyrna, was no, about 40 miles from Ephesus. So uh, geographically, these cities, by today's standards, were relatively close. In the standards of this day, there was some distance it's important to note that Pergamos was noted for its vast library containing 200,000 volumes. By, by any standard, a large, thorough library. And it's important to make note of that because of their passion for knowledge, which parallels, I think, the passion that Western culture has for knowledge. In the same city, there were several imposing temples, temples to Zeus, Apollo, Athena, even a, 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 a temple to Caesar himself, and also a healing cult called Asclepius uh, was a, a temple as well. Now, these temples were large. In fact, they had a prominent place within this city. It's also to be noted that this city is called Satan's Seat by John, and some believe that this would refer to the persecution of the churches. In fact, in verse 13, the latter part, it says, who, who was put to death in your city where Satan lives. 
it, it remembers here when we're, we were teaching on Smyrna, he said the same thing, virtually the same thing. In verse 9, it says, I know the slander on the part of those who say that they are Jews but are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. So obviously, Satan had a stronghold in this region of the country. And this reminds us that the first century church suffered under tremendous persecution. Un, unparalleled, <coughs> unparalleled persecution. And I want to express to you today as well, if you're reading the news, uh, watching carefully, you'll note that this is a growing, that is persecution is growing in the world today, all over the world. In fact, I believe with all of my heart that persecution is growing even in the United States. Perhaps not to the degree in many parts of the world today, but still, it is a growing sense, a growing spirit of the Antichrist in the world today. John Minson's Antipas, who refused to renounce his faith, in fact, he refused to announce his faith, renounce his faith, and it cost him his life. Supposedly roasted alive in a hollow uh, life-sized bull which had a bonfire in its belly called the brazen bull. It was a, a means of torture that was common in that day and time. A, a very, very heathenistic and brutal um, uh, death by any stretch of the imagination. And as we read on, Jesus reminds us of the importance of the word of God. For he says... These, verse 12, these are the words of him, Jesus, these are the words of him who has a sharp double-edged sword. Now, it's important that the word of God is a guide that was used then and today to distinguish truth from deception. The only way to know a lie, the only way to know a deception, the only way to know a compromising way is to know the word of God. And for those believers who are not versed in the word of God, not only with knowledge, but also with obedience, they are prey then to deception uh, or to confusion. These words, verse 12, these are the words of him who has a sharp, double-edged sword. And Hebrews chapter 12, 4, verse 12 says to us, for the word of God is living and active. And then Jesus to John reiterates this point that was found in Hebrews. Living and active, sharper than a two-edged sword, a double-edged sword, piercing to the division of the soul and spirit, the joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. It is very important today that we know God's word. With deceptions pervasive today, we need a standard of absolute truth. And that's what God's word is. God's word is truth. Jesus said, my words are true. And, and to have an absolute truth becomes the guide of our life, the map of our life that helps us to negotiate through life or to navigate through life and to know what is wrong and to know what is right. Not by the mind of man, not by the intellect or whims of humanity, but by the mind, the heart, and the spirit of God. And so now we come to the commendation that we read just a moment ago in verse 13. Jesus said, You remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, not even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness. Jesus said, first of all, as a commendation to them, you were devoted. That word devoted means loyal, faithful. They were dedicated. Wouldn't that be wonderful for the Spirit of the Lord to say that to you and me today? That, that, that the Spirit of the Lord would say, would affirm to us, you are loyal to my word. You are faithful to the precepts of God's word. You are dedicated to the cause of Christ. Any of us would stand tall with that kind of affirmation from the Lord. And then verse 13 said, you remain true to my name. The church demonstrated conviction and courage by its mere existence in this city. The very fact that they ceased to or stopped meeting together, told of the testimony of their passion for the things of God. And also, the second commendation that was given to them is that they were devoted. They were of sound doctrine. Verse 13 goes on to say, You did not renounce your faith in me. Professing faith in Jesus Christ carried severe consequences in this 
bedrock of pagan activity, the synagogue of Satan, the city of Satan. To profess your faith, faith would bring severe consequences to your life. And you would think, with all of the commendations that they received, that the corrections would be rather minor. But if you assume that, you would be wrong. Verse 14 and 15 gives the correction to this church. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. There are some of you who belong to the teaching of Balaam, and we'll talk about that here in just a moment. Those taught, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin so that they ate food sacrificed to idols and committed sexual immorality. Likewise, you also have those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Repent, therefore, otherwise I will soon come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Pergamus embraced the teachings of Balaam. Uh, uh, Balaam was a, a non-Jew prophet. And you'll remember if you, you know your Bible very well, and many of you, even as children, would remember this. Uh, Balaam, three times his donkey heard from God or saw the angel of the Lord that, that Balaam didn't see. And then in one occasion, Balaam being angry and embarrassed, beat the donkey and the donkey turned around and spoke to him and said, why are you beating me? Now I've just got to tell you, if a donkey, or any animal for that fact, turned to me and began to speak, don't you know it would get my attention? But Balaam was so angry that he didn't even recognize that a donkey was speaking to him. But this Balaam prostituted his gift. He had a message from God, and he refused to do what Balak wanted him to do, to curse Israel three times. He refused to do it, but on the fourth, he prostituted himself for riches. Balaam counseled Balak on the most effective way to weaken Israel. It's incredible what a little bit of money would do. Through seduction, using the Moabites and the Midianite women, he called Balak to tempt Israelites into sexual relations and to pagan rituals. So once the children of Israel were faithful to God, but they were drawn away by seducing spirits. They turned away from God. Verse 14 says, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin. That word entice means to tempt or to seduce, a seducing spirit that would be so pervasive and so, so tempting of the flesh that they would fall into that. It means to attract. And all of this took place from Balaam's encouragement of Balak to not to curse. God would not curse the children of Israel, but Balak could seduce them through the word. James chapter 4, verse 4 says, You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, listen to these words, therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. It's incredible. John, 1 John chapter 2, verse 16 says, For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasures, a craving for everything we see, a pride in our achievements and in our possessions. These are not from the Father, but are from this world. Same things that Satan himself fell for, that humanity has been falling for ever since that day to this day. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. These three things are seducing spirits to seduce us away from our, our passion for God, our desire to, to bring ourselves into a place that we would be pleasing to God regardless of what the world might think about it. You see, the long fall from faith begins when we bargain with ourselves to excuse our sin. We say that again. The long fall from faith begins when we bargain with ourselves to excuse our sin. Christians are rejecting the call of the Spirit today to be separate and to be holy. We don't hear a lot about being separated from the world, and we certainly don't hear a lot about being holy. 
Be ye holy as I am holy, declares the Lord. Not in the sense that we are perfect, but in the sense that we are being daily transformed, that we are closer to God today, closer to the very image of Jesus Christ today than we were were when we first made our confession of faith. Today, many are rejecting the work of the Holy Spirit within life, not hearing, turning a deafened ear to the voice of the Spirit that brings conviction and revelation of those things that are wrong in our life, those things that have been compromised in our life. To reject spiritual transformation, a consistent and perpetual growth to become more and more like Jesus. Certainly not to become more and more like the world, not to become more and more like the church, not to become more and more religious, but to be transformed, to become more and more like Jesus. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17 says this, Therefore come out among unbelievers and separate yourself from them, says the Lord. Do not touch their filthy things, and I will welcome you. Which also says that if we are induced, if we are enticed, if we are seduced, seduced to not separating ourselves from the world, then it could be stated that God would reject us. And in this separation, the Spirit is not talking about a physical separation. God is not talking about us removing ourselves completely from the the world. I used to have people would come to me and they would say, Pastor, uh, my my job is horrible. People on my job are heathens. They don't love God. They uh, pray with me that I would find a job where, where there were only Christians. And I used to take them by the hand and I used to fervently pray, oh God, help them to find, lead them to a job where only Christians were. And then one day, the Holy Spirit had me listen to my prayer and I thought to myself, no, no. Could it be that God has called you to that place of darkness so that his light might radiate? If light flees from darkness, there is no option but darkness. But we are called to be light. And light is never brighter than when it is shining in the darkness. We're not not called to a physical separation, but to a spiritual separation. Not to do the things of the world. Not to be like the world. Not to embrace or be seduced by the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. The calling of the Spirit is not to be as close to the world as possible and still follow Jesus. The fact of the matter is the call of the Spirit of God within every believer in this generation is called to be further and further separated from the ways of this world. There was a wealthy man who was hiring a chauffeur. And he had two applicants. He had uh, had measured it down to two applicants. And so he took both of the applicants with his stretch limousine up to the top of a mountain where there was a cliff And he told these two chauffeurs, I want you to get in the limousine. I want you to drive as close to the edge of the cliff as you possibly can without going over. Let me repeat that. Drive as close to the cliff. Get those tires as close to the cliff as you possibly can without falling over the cliff. The first driver, chauffeur, got in the car and revved up the engine and started off and he moved forward, edged forward ever closer and closer and closer to the edge until he was literally inches from the edge of the, of the cliff. When he was done, he got out proudly and looked at his accomplishments and thought he had done so well. The wealthy man asked for the second chauffeur to get into the car and they had backed it up and the second chauffeur got in and he drove. But rather than driving towards the cliff, he put it in reverse and drive further back away from the cliff. Who do you think got the job? The chauffeur who drew further away. For it's not how close you can get to the edge before you fall off. It's how far God can take you away from the edge to sanctify, to redeem, and to bring you into his personal relationship and into his joy. It's not how close you can get to the edge without falling off. It's how far away from the edge of worldliness that we can get into our lives. Believers in Pergamos looked for an excuse for their sin. And they looked to excuse their sin. John chapter 3 verse 19 through 21 says this. This is the crisis that we're in. God light streamed into the world and into believers' hearts. But men and women everywhere ran for the darkness. 
They went for the darkness because they were not really interested in pleasing God. Let me read that again. They went for the darkness. They compromised for the darkness because they really weren't interested in pleasing God. Here's the question. Who are we interested in pleasing? Everyone who makes a practice of doing evil, addicted to a denial and illusion or disillusion, hates God's light and won't come near it, fearing a painful exposure. But anyone working and living in truth and, and reality welcomes God's light so that work can be seen for the work God is in. Here's the excuses that many people today have in terms of excusing their flesh, compromising their faith. 2020 excuses. I do good works. The good that I do outweighs the compromise of my life. Another 2020 excuse is, I'm a good person. I, I, I do okay. I'm not evil. Another excuse is, well, I'm not as bad as the rest of them. I'm not even as bad as the people in the church. Isn't that interesting? Isn't it interesting that people will find excuses to allow them to continue to sin? Excuses that give them what they feel is the right to compromise their faith. So hard-hearted, some of them, that they don't even think about it anymore. They don't even consider it. They don't even have to come up with an excuse because their heart has become so hardened against the voice of the Spirit. You see, believers are called to fight against the compromises of this world, to resist the compromises of this world. Colossians chapter 3, verse 5 says, Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, greed, which is idolatry. And that's not the completed list, and we know that. We know those things that are pleasing to the flesh but are displeasing to God. And now we come to the Nicolaitans. Not only to the compromise of Balaam, to compromise the flesh, to be seduced by the things of the world, but also the Nicolaitans, which weren't, weren't much different. Verse 15 says, Likewise, you also have those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans, a very similar in nature to the seductions of, of Balak. Many theologians believe that the first mention of Nicholas or Nicol for the Nicolaitans was found in Acts chapter 6, verse 5, interestingly, interestingly enough. Now, there are, there is some argument whether or not Nicholas found in the Bible in Acts chapter 6, verse 5 was actually the one. Many believe that he is. And this is what the Bible says, Acts chapter 6, verse 5, in the selection of the first deacons of the church. And the same pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith, and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nacar, and Timon, and Permius, and Nicholas the proselyte to Antioch. The early church leaders, to the, according to the writing of the early church leaders, the doctrine of the Nicolaitans was a doctrine of the teaching to compromise. In other words, not just allowing compromise or being seduced, but actually te teaching how to be compromised. In other words, teaching something other than the pure word of God, including Nicolaitans, including commingling Christianity and the practice of the occult. Now, how far do you have to fall? How far do believers have to fall to a, comp a point where they will accept the teachings of the occult into the practices of Christianity? Because they're com completely contrary to one another. The American culture... Christians now face a choice to blend in society or stand out in this culture of compromise. In this day and time, many are compromise, compromising or have been seduced. Now, I'm not here to judge. It's not my place to judge. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. But remember, in this church at Pergamos, there were some whose heart was so hard they couldn't even tell the difference between right and wrong, between righteousness and unrighteousness. Many people in the church today, like Solomon, attempt to marry several wives, spiritually speaking. Many Christians are content to marry God with money or possessions. Content to marry God with lust, physical and emotional emotion. 
desiring to marry a relationship with God with self, with self-promotion, with a spirit of self and self-centeredness. But the Bible teaches us we can only serve one master. We can only serve one master. I leave you with these scriptures. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14 through 18 in the message version says, don't become partners with those who reject God. How can you make a partnership out of right and wrong? That's not a partnership, that's war. Is light best friends with dark? Does Christ go strolling with the devil? Do trust and mistrust hold hands? Who would think of setting up pagan idols in God's holy temple? Now, obviously, we read the scripture and we say, well, I would never do that. But many today have compromised their faith and allowed idols to enter into their lives. But that's exactly what we are, each of us, a temple in whom God lives. God himself put it this way, I'll live in them, move into them, I'll be their God, and they'll be my people. Then he adds, so leave the corruption and compromise. Leave it for good, says God. Don't link up with those who will pollute you. I want you all for myself. I love that. God is so jealous of our relationship with him. I want you all for myself. I'll be a father to you. You'll be my sons and my daughters. With all of the correction that was necessary for the church of Pergamos, there also came a promise. Aren't you glad that the corrective nature of the Holy Spirit within our life is not to destroy us? The heart of God is not to cast us aside, but to draw us in. Draw us in by his word. To draw us in by his spirit. And those of us who know him, the Bible says, my sheep know my voice. Again, at the beginning where Jesus said, my word is like a double-edged sword. When we know God's word, we know God's voice. I want to say that again. When we know God's word, we know God's voice. Scripture says, my children, my sheep will know my voice, and another they will not follow. And while there was need for correction in this church, as there is need for correction in the church today, there is a promise. Verse 17 says, whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious. That is an anthem over and over again in the seven letters to the seven churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give some hidden manna. We'll talk about that. I will also give that person a white stone with a new name on it, known only to the one who receives it. You see, if we would repent, he promised us, number one, that we would be fed with hidden manna, hidden from the world, hidden from the mind of those who have no relationship with God, that God would satisfy them in a way that the world would not. I want to say that again, that hidden manna is the Spirit of God, the Word of God, a relationship with God that will satisfy us in such a way the world could never do, could never accomplish. Secondly, he promised us that he would give us a white stone. Now that's interesting because we don't hear much about that today. But a pebble was used in courts of justice. White pebbles meant acquittal. In other words, white pe pe pebbles meant not guilty. And the word says that if we would repent, he would promise that when we stand before him, when, we, when he welcomes us into, the, into, the, into heaven, into our reward, God himself, the Bible says, will welcome us. And when he does, there'll be a white stone. Perhaps we will hand him the white stone, or perhaps he will hand us. Nonetheless, it will be said they are acquitted. In other words, not guilty. The minute you ask God to forgive you of your sins, the minute you repent, he declares not guilty. Once and for all. And thirdly, if we repent, repent, God promised that he would give us a new name. I love that. I, I love the thought of that. Give me a new name. I, I wonder what my new name would be. You know, it wasn't common in the early church that if somebody had a commitment to the Lord, they would be given a new name. Jesus did that. He, God gave Peter a new name, gave Saul a new name, others a new name. I wonder what my new name would be. In many cultures today, names reflect the nature of that individual. It's a prophetic word. When their children given to them to prophesy into their life over and over again, not so much in Western culture, so that the child would grow up with the name pleasing to God, blessed 
of the Lord. And you know when that's spoken into your life over and over again, you believe it, you accept it, it becomes your birthright, it is your name. That name includes a new relationship, child of God. I think if I were to be given a, a new name on this earth and somebody suggested that the new name for Pastor Steve would be child of God, I would revel in that. I would rejoice in that name. But a name that would also indicate not only a relationship with God, but would indicate a new hope, a living hope, a lasting hope, an eternal hope that comes to me by the God of all hope. But also a new name that would indicate new triumphs, that would indicate new victories in our life each and every day because in Jesus we are victorious. Times may be difficult today. You may be facing difficult circumstance, but I want you to know, he who is faithful is given a crown of victory. Victory through Jesus Christ. James chapter 1, verse 12 said, Blessed is a man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive a crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. And 1 John chapter 2, verse 24 and 25 says, What you have heard from the beginning must remain in you. If what you have heard from the beginning remains in you, then you will remain in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he himself made to us. Here it is, eternal life. That's the promise to those who live, unlike many in Pergamos, who live faithful to God, uncompromising faith in the name of the Lord. And so I want to encourage you in conclusion, choose repentance. Repentance is not just one act, by the way. Repentance is something that we do whenever it is revealed that there is sin in our life where we have done wrong or where we have chosen other than God's best where we have compromised or sinned. Choose repentance. And when you choose repentance to a God that is ready to forgive, desires to forgive, has offered the invitation to forgiveness, when you choose repentance, you choose being fed by new manna. That which satisfies the heart and the spirit. That which will satisfy where the world will never satisfy. When you choose repentance, you will choose to accept the white stone. The stone that says, not guilty. The stone that speaks acquittal. That when we stand before God, we don't stand guilty of our sin, but we stand forgiven through Jesus Christ. And finally, when you choose repentance, when you choose not to compromise your faith, you choose a new name. I don't know what your new name will be, but I pray that among a new name would be this, that we would be known as children of the Most High God, that I would be known as a child of God. I don't think there'd be a greater blessing in my life than that. Choose an uncompromising faith in Jesus Christ. And where we have compromised, where we have tried to spiritually marry the world and the kingdom of God together, and you can't do it. They're incompatible with one another. We repent. and We ask God to remove and to forgive us. Heavenly Father, in a day and time where the church is pressured to compromise continuously, and where that pressure to compromise, like in the church of Pergamos, is so prevalent today, so strong, and growing stronger in this nation every day. I pray that you give us strength to know the word, the double-edged sword. And as we stand upon that word of God, we glean, we understand, we know the difference between kingdom and the world and never try to marry the two of them together. That we reject the compromise. We reject the pressure to compromise. We reject the pressure to be like the world. For the word says, some will have a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof. I pray, Heavenly Father, that we will come out from among them, not in a physical sense, but in a spiritual sense. That we will embrace the word of God, Lord, with joy, with thanksgiving, with transformation. Father, help us 
not to compromise our faith. And Lord, when we're being drawn away by the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life, by the compromises of the enemy, Lord, reveal that to us. And Father, as we know the word, as we know that double-edged sword, we will know those compromises. We will know when there is lust of the eyes. We will know when there is lust of the flesh. We will know where there is the pride of life. And we will choose God. And when there is that word by the Spirit that reveals that we have compromised, Lord, we repent. And by repenting, Lord, we choose new manna, a white stone, and a new name. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. A new name, child of God. Praise the Lord. I want to encourage you in your stewardship. I thank God that he is faithful to us. I thank God that he is always watching over us. In fact, our theme for the month of August is God will make a way. In fact, I will declare to you, many have already experienced in this pandemic that God has already made a way. He continues to make a way in our life. Joshua chapter 1 verse 9 says, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened. Do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. The Lord is with you. In fact, he's not just with you. He is in you. He, he, is, he is thoroughly surrounding your entire life. And, and, and if it's difficult right now in your life, if it is difficult, if you are going through the harshest times of your life, this is your promise. God will make a way. And then in Isaiah chapter 41, it tells us what he will do. 41.13 says, For I, the Lord your God, hold your right hand. <laughs> it is I who say to you, Fear not, I am the one who helps you. The scripture, prophet Isaiah said, It's God who holds our right hand. Aren't you glad? And God says, I'll walk with you. And don't you know, if God is holding your right hand, He'll never let you fail. He'll never let you fall. He'll never abandon you. And when it's tough and when it's hard, He'll be there, right there with you. And I have a word for you. When you hit a setback, take a step back, get ready to make your comeback because God will make a way. Praise the Lord. God will make a way. In fact, I pray that you'll open your eyes of faith to see the way that he is making in your life even today. Three things I want to share with you. Number one, and I end every service with these words, relax, relax. God is in control. He's in control of your life. He's in control of your circumstances. He's in control of every de detail, from the smallest, most insignificant of details, the number of hairs on your head, to the largest, most unbelievable, significant issues of your life. You can relax, because God is in control. The second thing that I want to remind you of this is this, Don, and I love you. We, we, we love you. Words cannot express what is in our heart. We pray for you every single day. Not a day goes by that we do not call you before the, name, before the throne of God. The pastors, the deacons, the administrative facility staff, the trustees, all of the worshipers of Brazewood, we call you before the Lord and ask God to bless you as you have never been blessed before. If it is possible, through this pandemic, Gadana and I have grown to love you more and more. And then finally, I want to ask this. Would you please stay tuned for the upcoming Brazewood announcements? We want you to be aware of all of the things that are coming your way so that you might be involved, engaged in the church and in the work of the kingdom. God bless you. We love you. And we look forward to seeing you very soon. God bless.